I really appreciate the chance to be here because uh, so much of, of what I'm involved with and, and perspective that I've gained over 30 years in agriculture in Colorado is, is really has become centered around water and, and all that we do with it. So um, when there's been some amazing statistics and, and information shared through this whole, through this whole uh, symposium, often what's lacking when, when it comes to, to the, the public and education, and I'm getting way ahead of myself here, I put this slide in here to remind me of, of, of an educational tool that we started putting together several years ago. Did, did any of you get a deck of cards from, from our booth in the other area over there? Carla did, I know she did. Did you unwrap them, Carla? You did, okay. If you take the cellophane off, you'll you'll see that every single card has a unique fact about Colorado agriculture. And yes, they're heavily weighted towards corn and livestock, but there's also water facts. And we did not come up with this idea. We stole it from Nebraska, as many good ideas come from the East. But um, I would encourage, I mean, there's a wealth of information that could be disseminated in a variety of ways. And I've been amazed at the popularity of this forum for sharing information and, and it gives you something you know, useful to read and talk about while you're waiting on the other person to bid. So there, there is a, a, a positive uh, use for that. So, and I would challenge you to, to take that idea or any that that might generate and, and apply them to water education because so many of the speakers have talked about how, how incredibly valuable it is that we, that we reach out and, and communicate to people who don't know where their water comes from. We face it every day, every week, in helping consumers to understand where their food comes from and how those, those systems are connected so, so vitally. Um, these, this, this outreach and information is so valuable because more and more people are talking about agriculture. I think in my lifetime, agriculture is more commonly used now in people's vocabulary than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. And it, and it comes to bear on, on issues like environmental sustainability. Where is the pointer part of this? Top? There we go, okay. And, um, but often what's, what's lacking is perspective. So, what I was challenged, and Perry talked to me about, about presenting to you today, is, is, is some of the perspective gained over that 30 years of, of working in Colorado agriculture, because where we've been can be so incredibly valuable in helping us understand what needs to happen next. And then, in addition to that, we'll take a brief, when we're done with that, we'll take a little look at, at the future of irrigated agriculture, and, and try to apply those fundamentals about the trends of where we've been uh, along with it. Because you know, on top of environmental sustainability, we have, we have issues of nutrient criteria development. Who can tell me what the, the poster child project is related to nutrient criteria development? This is a nationwide effort. Anyone venture a guess? Who said that? Right there. Chesapeake Bay, on the, on the eastern coast has that whole feature. By the way, any, I'll, I'll, I'm going to reward participants. Now those things don't fly very uh, accurately, so if, if I miss the guy or the, the lady who, who responds to the question, you know, I need you, I trust you all to hand it to the person because I'm going to just wing them out there, all right? So, but that's right, nutrient criteria development is, is the eastern coast example of, of why we need to care about that, and certainly agriculture has a role in that whole process. Um, ammonia volatil volatilization and uh, deposition, wh why, why does that matter? What, in, what, in, in what sense does it matter here in, in uh, Leadville, Colorado, in the headwaters? All right, it, it, because it ha is having an effect, I'm sorry, it's having an effect on, on high, on alpine ecosystems. Uh, ammonia that, that, that typically we would apply in an agricultural setting and wouldn't generally move more than a mile from its application site, all of a sudden now is able to get 
get wings because of the presence of, of NOx emissions, for example. There's other mechanisms. But that's one of the ways that that, that ammonia molecule hitches a ride and, and can literally travel hundreds of miles and, and to extreme altitudes and there then get deposited through rain and snow events. So, you know, relatively subtle amounts of, of nitrogen then can, be, can begin to have a profound uh, impact on a fragile ecosystem at high altitude where a pound or two of nitrogen per year can have a, can have a significant impact. So uh, the history is important. We're going to look at trends, future. We'll keep rolling. I promise I won't take that long on every slide. I've only got 114, so I'm pretty sure I'll be done by about 3 o'clock. So it'll be, it'll be great. Um, we'll look at uh, trends related to land use, to irrigation methods, and to uh, nutrient management. Within the land use category, <clears throat> uh, we heard others talk, uh, Mike talked, uh, Alan this morning talked about, about transfers, alternative ag transfers. That's one of the things that fits this, this uh, category, ag to idle. And then there's ag to urban. I mean, you don't get the kind of growth that we've experienced in recent years without um, building on land. All that, uh, all that growth is not going to always be vertical. So uh, we'll just take a look at a brief period, five years. It covers this, uh, the most recent census data uh, accumulated in 2007. 16 million U.S. acres have come out of farming. Does that surprise anybody? Denver, <coughs> excuse me, Denver in the Front Range is not the only place that urban growth is, is, a, is a common phenomena. It's happening in Omaha, Des Moines, uh, Springfield, Illinois. Every place that I talk to people who are engaged in agriculture, they lament about the loss of agricultural land. In Colorado alone, 47,000 acres came out of farming just in that five-year period. Another another three quarters of a million acres idled from uh, through reserve programs through uh, federal reserve programs Now that's not all bad because some of those lands are are sensitive and and maybe shouldn't have been put in production in the first place but we'll talk about that more a little bit later and um, and in Colorado alone and again in that five-year period over a million acres have come out of irrigated production since 1994. So you don't do that without having a profound effect on, on, on the amount of production, the amount of uh, uh, agricultural production, but also the amount of nutrients and water used to, to produce that crop. So just kind of high altitude pr uh, perspective. And this, this information is going to be more targeted at South Platte because that's, that's kind of the, the stomping ground that I'm most familiar with and I have the best data on related to the, the curtailment of wells, but you know, that's not the only watershed that that's happened. Certainly it has in the Arkansas as well. But, but it's am amounted to a profound number of acres in that watershed alone, the South Platte, over 92,000 acres, where not only is, is, there le is there dramatically less irrigation water used, but there's dramatically less in terms of nutrient applications as well. So when there's fewer nutrients applied, then logically there's going to be fewer nutrients available to leach or volatilize or, or transport in any number of ways. I don't have a good number for the, for the impact, uh, uh, the Arkansas Valley impact from the result of, of Kansas versus Colorado, but again, profound. Urban population, we can't talk about this without, without connecting the two. And uh, so in that, in a time frame from 2000 to 2008, you know, Colorado increased about 15% and the U.S. about 8%. In a broader time frame from, from 1980 forward, Colorado increased about 70%. So what happens when, you know, when that, when that land is converted? Do we, uh, we tend to think that fertilizer is all about agriculture. Um, anybody venture a guess on, on how much nitrogen per acre on a per acre basis? I forgot a critical question. 
this, this is a pretty astute group. Who can tell me how big an acre is? Exactly. Very close. What was it? 43,560. We have a winner. It's 43,560 square feet, to be exact, which is roughly the size of a football field with the end zones, you know, give or take a few feet. So it's a good, helpful, uh, you know, visual reference to think about. Um, what, is the, what is the typical rate per acre of, of nitrogen application on a golf course, for example? That's a very good guess. Anyone want to refine that a little bit? 225. <laughs> Do I hear 250? Who bit of, anyway, good, good guess. You both deserve a cap. Um, it's not unusual to, for, for a lawn or a, uh, a golf course manager over the course of the season to apply over 300 pounds of nitrogen. Thank you both for participating. Um, that's, that's a little staggering. That's actually more nitrogen than is applied on a typical acre of corn. Yet, corn is the poster child you know, for nit nitrogen use in uh, not only in Colorado, but nationally. But with that urbanization comes, still, you have urban landscapes, whether it be a lawn or a golf course, uh, and, and that, uh, those, those are significant. The, the needs um, for water don't go away when you convert to urban. The fertilization we just talked about, common rates, um, and I think it's, it's important to know that the, the, the uh, affluent and the water treatment discharges as a whole or as a percentage of the total water in, in, in a watershed uh, certainly goes up. In terms of, of tillage, um, I think there's some, it's, it's worth noting a couple things here. This, the, the scale, the wording is very small, but just note that the red, the red bars indicate conventional tillage, which in, I, I'm, I, I'm always surprised I run into someone who doesn't, doesn't understand, well, you know, Mark, what's tillage? Well, tillage is, we typically associate it with a moldboard plow, and that, that would be refer, uh, uh, referenced by the red line in terms of conventional tillage, where clean uh, topsoil, clean surface, no residue, basically would be the, 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 the method. The, the yellow, or I'm sorry, the, the more clear line that's, that's trending upward relates to conservation till, which is a reflect, reflects a multitude of practices that leave more of that crop residue sticking out of the, of the soil surface, which is helpful not only to, to catch and collect rain and snow during the winter, but more importantly, it, it, it provides the, the, the building blocks for increased soil organic matter, because as the little bugs and beasts and worms and, and, and weather factors decay that, that material, it, turns, it, 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 it enhances the soil uh, mo uh, uh, characteristics increasing the organic matter, which in turn helps with soil water holding capacity, the ability of the soil to retain water to be used for plant production. Shift to irrigation trends, and we'll, we'll look at a few related to methods, uh, methods of irrigation as well as, as the water that gets pumped uh, through those systems. Uh, just quickly hit on a few, on a few key uh, trends, and that is, uh, that would include uh, those transfers that, that have been brought about earlier, or been talked about earlier. Where, where are municipalities going to likely, where has been the target for them, the easy uh, source for, them, for municipalities to, uh, to get water, certainly agriculture. Um, but the increased efficiencies, and, and, and Mike just previous to me talked about some of the amazing technology that is in increasing a farmer's ability to produce more with less. Really, uh, a more elabor elaboration on the same point. Um, it, it allows for, for uh, better water management techniques so that ultimately, whether it be uh, deficit irrigation or any, any number of, uh, of precision uh, scheduling, like the example of the young man 
uh, scheduling his irrigation you know, remotely uh, on his phone while he was pretending to pay attention to something else, probably. Uh, uh, in terms of statistics, these are, these are facts you don't just, that don't just pop out. They don't appear on the front page of the, of the uh, USDA website. But, and this is Colorado alone. Drip irrigation increased by um, about 23,000 acres. Sprinkler uh, irrigation has increased. Flood and furrow has decreased. 113,000 acres no longer irrigated, and that's just a South Platte figure right there. Uh, two, 200, uh, almost a quarter of a million acres converted from flood to other methods. What's a, what's a potential downfall? Uh, what, what's a, maybe an unintended consequence of, of these efficiencies? That's right, but, but well, we can't take that from you because we already earned a cap. What's another term for that? Return flows, exactly. And, and why are return flows so significant? Because that return flow from, from a, a, a Brighton area farmer might be the water right for a Sterling area farmer. Our system is so incredibly developed. You've heard probably many other speakers talk about how many times water is used in the South Platte, for example. I don't know the number for the Arkansas, but it's estimated that seven to 10 times within the South Platte drainage system, watershed, um, water gets used and reused. So when, you, when we start uh, celebrating these efficiencies, we have to realize there are some very serious consequences, potentially, as well. The good news is there's also less uh, runoff and leaching potential, which serve some of those first key points on the very first slide related to the EPA nutrient criteria development and the, uh, the whole ammonia volatilization issues. I didn't claim to have the answers, just offering perspective, remember. Irrigation trends, um, I, think we've, I think we're hungry enough. We can, uh, we, we've covered this one probably uh, well enough. Um, I, I, there is a point, though, that I'll get to a little bit later to develop. Uh, there, keep in mind, there's, there's a shift when, 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 when water is transferred from agricultural use to municipal, there is an inherent shift in incentives. Uh, the in incentives being to, uh, uh, to be efficient, to, to have your your end product be as clean as possible. So just hang on to that thought. Uh, in terms of nutrient management trends, we're going to we'll focus on nitrogen and phosphorus because those are the two main nutrients that, in that nutrient criteria development process, those are the two most concerned about. If you are a not if you are a point source um, polluter, and, you know that's not a popular term, but hey, there's you know, in agriculture, we're considered non-point source polluters. It's, it's kind of a, a fact of life, but we're working very hard to minimize that. If you're a municipality or an urban user, you're considered a point source and, and you are regulated. Uh, anybody in here represent a point source? It's okay. We'll have a support group later. Yes, good. Thank you. Um, so those are the two we focus on. Those are also two of the three uh, macronutrients used in agricultural production, whether you're growing corn or beans or melons or, or uh, uh, any other agricultural commodity. Nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium are the three that, uh, macronutrients needed in a big way. The success story in agriculture, really over, over the last 25 years and beyond, that's, I just have data for 25 years, is that we're producing more with less. And, and you might think, well, Mark, you're kind of stuck on corn. I understand that, but, but it's a good representative crop because it's not only the, the crop grown in the most abundance across the United States, it's also the crop grown in the most abundance within Colorado. Um, and, and it tends to be a, a heavy nutrient user. So it's a, it's a reasonably justifiable example. Uh, nationwide, we're using, we're producing 75% more than we did in 1980, and we're doing it on less nutrients overall. We look at the per bushel uh, basis now, nationally for corn again, nutrient use of those three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, 
is less, has, has declined since 1980. And here's just some of the data from the Fertilizer Institute that tracks that, that, that overall, this, uh, we're, we're using 10% less. And this, again, is on a per bushel basis, which really drives at the whole efficiency factor. Nitrogen specifically, out of those top three macronutrients, nitrogen has declined also among all those sources, among all its sources, such as, uh, you know, whether it be uh, UAN solution, uh, we typically, you know, those of you who are familiar with fertilizers, 32% uh, uh, nitrogen would be a combination of urea, ammonium, and nitrate. Uh, there's other forms of that. By the way, who can tell me what the most common source of nitrogen used on urban landscapes is, like grasses, golf courses, parks, yards? What, who can tell me what the most common nitrogen source is? Grass yes, grass fertilizers. Urea, exactly. Uh, what is, since we're on a roll here, what, what's most significant about urea in terms of its characteristics? Very volatile. It's very volatile, excellent. And so if you're a farmer and you put on urea on your, on your corn or, or bean or beet or, or melon crop, you, you, you know that you need to irrigate it in or till it in in order to avoid volatility to avoid volatilization losses. If you're a homeowner and, you're, and you um, have the, the lawn spray service come out and spray your yard or you're managing a park for a municipality, you, you're generally at the mercy of the, the schedule of, of the applicator. Um, is it possible that it might be a, a one to two to three to maybe five days before that nitro, before you run your sprinkler system and that urea gets uh, incorporated into the soil where the roots can use it, it's very possible. There's a disconnect there in terms of the control. I just bring that up because that can be a significant point in terms of, you know, when we talk about ammonia volatility, urea is the most volatile. It can, it can have significant losses within days if the temperatures are high, if there's a lot of evaporation going on, or if there's a lot of wind taking place. So um, key thing, uh, things to, to uh, keep track of. Plus, if you're a homeowner and you buy a, you buy a bag of fertilizer uh, at, at Home Depot and you put it in your spreader and, and you end up with you know, half a bag left over and you, know, you don't want to store it, so you just go over it again, what, you know, what's likely to happen there? Is it if you have then a two inch rainfall event within a, within a, a few weeks, is some of that unused nitrogen likely to end up into this, in, the, in the sewer system and, and exacerbate the problem that the municipality uh, manager, water treatment people are dealing with? I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, so, I promised I'd be quicker, so we've, we've got to pick it up here. Mo uh, phosphorus is the other key nutrient, but it acts dramatically different. It is not volatile. It's not so mobile. In fact, it attaches pretty tightly to soil particles. In most of our Colorado soils, that would be the case. And so it generally, you know, you're not going to get phosphorus to move out of the agricultural system unless you have dirt move. But that ties back to why, you know, those, those changes in tillage practices are so important. Because if you can minimize, you know, soil uh, erosion uh, by, by maintaining, you know, excellent uh, you know, barriers to keep that dirt from moving and things for, the, for it to cling to, then, then you have really impacted the mobility not only of the soil resource that you need the next year, but, but you've also impacted the ability of phosphorus to move out of your system and into some place where it can't be helpful. So key drivers related to these three trends um, is back to this economically incentivized thing. A farmer produces the less he can has to buy in terms of nutrients, then the more chance he has for a profitable operation. So it's important to keep that in mind that farmers are not economically rewarded for being wasteful. They generally didn't survive, and their parents and their grandparents didn't survive generations and decades of, of really tough commodity prices by being wasteful. So they learned to be very efficient, and they've been rewarded for that. 
On the other hand, and this isn't a criticism, it's just a fact of life, that when a, when a, uh, a point source uh, entity, like a municipality or an industry, has to clean up their, the, the flow that, that, that they emit, it costs money, and it costs a serious amount of money. So as we've, as we've looked at these three trend, these, the trends uh, over the last 25 to 30 years, related to land use, irrigation methods, and, and nutrient management, um, it's difficult to find much evidence uh, that, that agricultural contribution to stream, fl stream flow and rivers and lakes new, uh, loading of nitrogen and phosphorus, it's difficult to find evidence that, that the agricultural component is getting bigger. That was a, you know, all those previous slides really were to, to, to validate this, this claim that I just made. So what's ahead for irrigated agriculture? And I primarily focus this on, on water and availability. And I promise we're getting very close. Um, you all have heard of the golden rule. Who can tell me what it is? That is the common one. She said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But I would argue, in our world of water, it is he who has the gold rules. But, but actually, in our world of water, it's he who has the water rules. And uh, um, we often, you know, from a perspective standpoint, we, 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 we think water originates... Uh, well, there's a lot of opinions about where water originates. Where is it in this, in this water cycle diagram? Who can point to, to the starting point? The sky? How does it get in the sky? A continuous cycle. Who said that? All right. Would you make sure that gentleman gets his hat? Okay. That's right. The challenge is how do, we, how do we capture and control this dynamic thing? Because it's never static, is it? Even when we think we've got it captured, it's, it's always changing. If it's in Dillon Reservoir, it's, it's seeping, it's evaporating, it's, it's, and, and there's constantly, you know, snow melt in most years that would, you know, is replacing some of it. So, so um, and we never really get to own it, but we do get to borrow it and use it and interrupt its path so that, but then eventually, even when we use it for crops, most of it goes back into the atmosphere and falls again somewhere else. So um, just, just uh, useful to know as we have conversations uh, uh, with, with others about how we solve problems related to that control and capture. Some of the issues related to the future of irrigated agriculture, and again, I don't have the answers, but th this is some perspective. Um, where, where, do, where, does, where do we find the clustering of people in power? Urban areas, exactly. Because they have a, they have a system, they're organized. They have mechanisms for charging water use fees. Um, it's, just, it's just the way things work. Uh, and that provides advantages in terms of uh, uh, well, coagulating, you know, collecting uh, the infrastructure and the funding to build uh, resources to control and capture uh, that water. And, and, and that results in, in decisions that favor movement of that water towards the clustering of the people in power. What about, uh, store, what about that storage capacity? I mean, I, I, there's probably few, there's probably some that would argue we have all the storage we need. There's probably more that would argue that both uh, surface and alluvial, we need to figure out how to be more efficient uh, in, in, in capturing and controlling uh, because, I mean, evidence is certainly on the front range, there's, there's a fair amount of water recognized that le has left our state in, in past years that, and, and in over-appropriated um, 
uh, watershed. So had we had more infrastructure to collect that, maybe we could have put it to more use and, and uh, been more efficient. We have a growing demand for ag products. I think earlier this morning, Alan was talking about the population growth that is expected by the year 2050. It's fairly staggering. I've heard that we're going to need to produce thousands of times more food between now and 2050 as has been produced since the beginning of farming. And that's, that's kind of a staggering thought when you realize that we're, we're in this constant process of, of transferring water from agriculture to municipalities. And uh, it caused me to wonder, well, why are we, you know, why, why do we have programs that, that, that encourage the permanent, uh, the permanent uh, uh, retirement of productive lands? There are reasons, and some of those, you know, because some of those really aren't very productive. Some of them should be retired, but, but I think we need to take a fresh look at that. And I'm really done apologizing. I'm almost done with the presentation, too, Ed. Uh, done apologizing for production, for irrigated agriculture, because it's, it's not well known that, that the um, western states that irrigate from North Dakota, South Dakota, western Nebraska, western Kansas, Texas, Colorado, while they represent about 13% of the nation's productive land supply, they, they produce over 20% of the nation's food, fuel, fiber, and, and energy supply. So it has, it has the effect of increasing consistency and, and really knocking off those valleys that otherwise would have happened in our nation's productive, production supply without irrigation. So uh, we really we need to work together, and I'll, and I'll end with this slide. Um, we, what agriculture produces, cities need. Uh, so the sooner that we figure out how to more effectively collaborate and accomplish processes and, and methods that, that complement uh, both sides of that equation, the better. So thank you. I appreciate it.